Hey, hello everyone. It is Chris, and um, this is a bit of a different episode. No intro, no outro, um, just a conversation. Because this morning I received a message from Henry, from a ship far, far away. And that message had an audio file attached to it, and I want to play you that audio. As of recording this, Henry is on a ship as a guide, and every now and then he gets a minute to talk to interesting people. And um, that's what he did. He sat down with his colleague and uh, legendary expedition leader, Sloane Jensen, and they talked for half an hour about this and about that, about the uh, changes in the polar regions as a, as a global issue, about excursions into the environment, about the climate, about COVID, and about the overall industry. And uh, I found it really delightful to listen to so you should you should definitely uh, have the chance to listen to it too. Quick warning, this won't be our usual sound quality. The recording environment on a ship is always difficult. There's always noise around. It's hard to find a quiet spot. So um, I did what I could to clean this up a bit and make it as enjoyable as possible. Anyway, here we go. Enjoy. All right. Hi, Solen. Welcome to, uh, to our show. Would you mind introducing yourself briefly? Thank you, Henry. Yeah, my name is Solon Jensen, and uh, I work for Park Expeditions as a, currently as an expedition leader and kayak guide and support uh, the team as best I can in a lot of different facets. And you work um, in the polar regions for a couple of years already? I have been, yeah. I started in 2003 with the National Science Foundation and then started working in this industry around 2006 with uh, Peregrine Polar Shipping, and then we merged with Clipper Cruise Lines and Quark all together in the great merger. <laughs> so the, 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 yeah. the start of everything, basically. Yeah. All right. Um, so you traveled both polar regions, Arctic and Antarctic? Is that right? I have, yeah. I've been really grateful to be able to do that. When did you come down to Antarctica first? Well, my first time working in Antarctica as a guide was in uh, 2005 six, and I remember our first excursion in the Antarctic Peninsula was Wilhelmina Bay. Oh, nice. Yeah, a light, light snow, and we were on the academic yaffe at the time, and uh, I was working as a kayak guide, and I remember we were out there floating around, starting to gather our people and begin some kind of a, a slow paddle through the snow and ice there, and uh, I'll never forget this. Captain Pasconi took the occasion to broadcast some classical music over the VHF radio. <laughs> <laughs> it was marvelous. A different time. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I can make your face one of the legendary ships of the first generation almost. Uh, traveling and working in the polar regions uh, for so long, um, do you have experienced some changes that became very obvious in the most recent years post-COVID maybe? Yeah, it's such a good question to think about changes. I think uh, just in the limited historical spectrum that we have, but relative to the history of our industry, it's been this exponential period of growth, you know, these last 15 years that I could speak about. And a couple of things come to mind. I think one of them is the the addition of almost an overabundance of media that people consume about the destination um, prior to arriving. And I guess what I mean by that is this sort of flow of social media. I remember when we first came down, you know, there was a few books right, that you would refer to, the Oceanides Guide, and um, these, the Crystal Desert, you know, a number of different books that you would sort of turn to for reference points, and then, and then you turn to the legends of the industry as well. And, and our, our guests, our travelers that would come down to visit us and that we would facilitate these experiences for, they had also spent time reading and thinking about place, creating the imaginary Antarctic and for themselves, right? And then they would come down and experience it for real. And then those things would blend. And now we have 
just, you know, this oversaturation, well, an extreme saturation of, you know, visual imagery that um, kind of explodes into people's consciousness around what it's like to be here. And I find that that overwhelms the reality of actually being here in, in a really curious way sometimes. And I, I can't say that it uh, behaves in a singular fashion for everyone by any means. Um, but I have noticed, I think over the years, that people have become more impatient, louder. More demanding. Yeah, more demanding of, I think, trying to act actualize the image that they saw. Yeah. Right? It's, a, it's a little bit like in, in, in the Northern Hemisphere when you do Northern Light Trips and people come with this very crisp, clear picture of multicolored Northern Lights and then they just see this faint greenish, grayish cloud on the sky and the guide's telling them that's the Northern Lights. Like, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And, and that, you know... Uh, Photography can pick up northern lights better than any human eye. Anyway. But absolutely. <laughs> but I think the, the behavior of um, how we consume media and landscapes has just changed so much. And when you remember when uh, Planet Earth a BBC series started, that was just like one of those moments when you're just like, oh, I want to see those places, I want to go there. And now you see how much more effort they put in there to have those super crisp, um, pictures of even more remote places or even more detailed or spending more time there and trying to get the last secret out of that and when people come down there they expect this kind of BBC moment on the location when they come there and that's very that's become very difficult and it strikes me that you know those images offer a type of intimacy yeah. right with the species and with the landscape that is extremely impactful and yeah. infectious and it's almost becomes what we're looking for and then we get here and we don't know how to manifest that it's kind of like how do i get that experience here now and you know for me it's a huge perspective shift for people that we try i think to to help um help people absorb it's like your binoculars you know <laughs> it's it's like, be with them at all times, you know? You can watch an animal's eyelid move through your binoculars and have yeah. that sort of moment, right? Um, and just spending time and, and stillness in the environment, on deck, whatever the context is, to absorb. And I guess, you know, that, that idea that it takes work on our side, on all of our sides, as experiencers, experiencers of the Antarctic, it takes work to be able to... <laughs> Just to put that all in place, we are in the dining room of Ocean <laughs> Adventure, and right now we're maneuvering a little bit. So. <laughs> Sounded a bit like an earthquake. <laughs> Just coming into position in the Beagle. <laughs> it takes work, I think, uh, to bring ourselves closer to the experience, and that's patience, and it's receptivity. And it's uh, allowing yourself to take in an experience that might not be precisely what you've imagined and letting the real wash over the imaginary that you've built. And it, it takes a lot more work now, I've found. People. Has it also changed on the size of the guide? Has the perception of the guides changed? What do you think? Say more about what you mean. So, for me, when I started working in the industry, I had a feeling of people come down here not only to to be in the destination, but largely to share their passion for the destination, to involve the guests in in the destination, to actually really uh, educate on the ground. And today I have the feeling of um, it's a lot of people in the industry that's just going to check off destinations and then they're good. I miss that spark. I miss the, in, in a lot of expedition teams, I, I really have the feeling of there is this passion missing. It's, it's really a lack of the will to engage, the understanding that we are part of a service industry, that we're actually there for the guests and not there for our own benefit. Yeah. 
that idea of service, I think, is can be lost quickly. Yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and serving guests, travelers, and serving the location, right, as well. Absolutely. It's kind of all, all one big thing. You know, we're here serving the polar regions by showcasing it to people that we're serving to show our passions and to bring home safely. And this idea of creating ambassadors, right, or, or people for whom this place is now among the things that they care about enough to mind what they do at home and maybe to even take a further step. But it brings to mind another point about change that I think you described really well the other day during one of our recap and briefings here, which was this idea that the impacts that the polar regions experience are so huge right now and that the source of many of those impacts are quite distant and so with the you know the tourism industry works extremely hard to minimize our disturbance to wildlife and our impact to the land and you know we could always do better no question about it but our consciousness is on that and uh it's very easy to forget, though, that our lifestyle decisions back home quantitatively eventually have just as big a reverberation on the effects of this environment. And uh, I find that difficult to bring home to people. You know, how do people really absorb that point? Um, do, you, do you have the feeling that changed um, throughout the years where um, people back home more receptive to that? A bit, a bit more, I feel, uh, a bit more careless now. A bit more careless? Yeah, or what's the word? Um, you know, you have, You have such a diverse amount of the global public visiting this place that I find myself really struggling to make generalizations, you know? And so forgive me for kind of going back and forth a little bit on this because it really just comes down to who you happen to be talking to <laughs> that day and what, what group of people you end up having these, you know, more in-depth conversations with around what we should be doing as a species right now. And I think that conversation has just gotten more complex. And in, in the face of that complexity, I feel like what I've seen is kind of people throwing their hands up and just being like, I don't really know what to do. I just want to come here and see these beautiful places as best I can. And uh, certainly feel like that's not enough that we can do more. And is the development of the industry probably also contradicting that a little bit? Because the core of what we do here is not only bringing the people to the place and showing them the place, but also educating them about the place and try to explain a little bit how everything is linked in the, um, yeah, in the global context. But with the new ships coming in that try to minimize the footprint, we also get more and more disconnected because the, the new ships, they you, you don't really feel um, the state of the sea anymore you don't really feel uh, the nature outside anymore unless you really go to an open deck and you go to a place you leave the ship for the first time go on a zodiac and you're completely surprised by the force of nature when suddenly the wind picks up and comes down with 50 60 knots oh, Henry, it's such a good point it's such an interesting thing to think about that impact of human experience in terms of the connection that we have, the immediacy of the connection that we have, the immediacy of the experience we have to the environment. You think about you know, the larger scale cruise ships that are coming down with a few thousand passengers yeah. and that those vessels so often are oriented towards keeping people's experience focused inward just for the you know, mm -hmm. um, variety of things to consume inward on the vessel and, and that these places really deserve 
all of our attention to be focused outward, right? And all of our efforts to be focused outward, whether that's from the deck or leaving our motherships. And then you think about scaling that down into smaller vessels and yachts and and uh, more intimate scales of that, smaller bubbles, if you will. And, uh, you know, from my personal experience, there's there's nothing as true there's nothing as truly impactful for someone's experience as their own receptivity and that could be on a 2,000 passenger vessel or on a 12 passenger vessel and I've traveled on 12 passenger vessels and had people that are you know so wrapped up in their own expectations that that there isn't a lot of receptivity to what's going on here and that's really hard as a guide yes I mean that's one of our things that we try to work through but um, I hesitate to make a claim about the impactfulness of a large ship versus a small ship, but we have seen that change begin to happen. And there's no question that, um, you know, larger spaces and larger vessels make the work of a guide to connect people with the environment harder. And so I think there is a really important question for companies to ask themselves. Um, what are we doing in addition to our normal operations and programs with larger vessels? What are we doing to make sure that we're really connecting people with the environment and with the landscape and with that personal space and experience with the web of life? Absolutely. And we've seen there have been a couple of changes um, also in the organizations that try to um, work with all the operators, both in the Arctic and Antarctica, to organize everything, to develop uh, the regions um, for the future. What, what is your expectation or what, what do you hope to see as a, as a change um, in the polar regions in the, in the next couple of years? Regarding our industry organization? Regarding the job we're doing regarding our place in the polar regions, regarding the polar regions itself. I've seen, like, Zara Olswick has been um, elected as president of the Inuit uh, Circumpolar uh, Council just recently, and she had a very, very strong message on the um, Arctic Circle um, Assembly, where she was just saying that no decision in the Arctic should be made without indigenous people. And for us, for a long time, when we're traveling in areas, for example, East Greenland, where you have very sparsely populated areas, you wouldn't even consider um, informing or reporting to the next bigger community somewhere, just because you think it's it's not necessary, it's not related. But once you actually work with the communities, you feel like um, they are hunters, they are just traveling very far, actually. So you have an impact on on their um, so the, on, on their personal behavior. And just hearing that um, that statement saying very very clearly, and it's not only because of uh, mining and resources, but particularly also tourism um, in places that have been crowded more in recent years. This summer in, in uh, East Greenland, we had I think three times the amount of ships that usually would be there at that time of the year. Uh, Arctic Canada was uh, suddenly flooded with, with vessels. Um, there's a shift in uh, where ships are going, where tourists are going, same around here in the Antarctic Peninsula. How do you think the region will change or has to change um, in, in the next couple of years? What, what do you expect? It's a very big question, sorry. There are companies that have done a lot of work to involve, to become involved in the communities that the industry visits throughout Greenland and the Canadian Arctic especially. So we, I, I don't in any way want to minimize that work, but it's extremely, extremely challenging work, partly because one of the questions that we come with isn't a question of should we or shouldn't we be here so often and that is a real question 
for visiting landscapes that are currently habitat for human beings as well. The Arctic is so much more complex from that point, I think. Certainly, yeah. There are some amazing programs that have developed over the last few years, I know, um, involving community members, not just in visits, which is something that's happened for a very long time and kind of is the, the groundwork, I think, of the way that this industry has interacted with communities, um, but also trying to provide different professional paths for community members that um, may be in our industry in a more central way. I hope to see that grow massively. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I, I do wonder about having a, a larger scale conversation within our industry about our own interaction with, you know, the huge variety of cultures that we might, you know, breeze through on a 20 day voyage. Uh, and in, in many ways, It's their space, it's their land, it's their oceans that we're moving through. And uh, yeah, with the history of how much, let's say people from the South have taken from the people of the North and the Northern Hemisphere uh, I think the conversations are just beginning and I'm really glad to see them evolving. Yeah, me too. Me too. I wish I had, you know, a more sort of conclusive thing to say, but I really feel like, uh, you know, each community is in many ways its own sovereign entity. Yeah. And so I think our industry is just beginning to kind of absorb that fact and even though we've been experiencing it for a long time what I guess what I mean by just beginning to absorb that is is really trying to meet it for what it is um, and that might have really big changes on how we conduct our, our expeditions in the north you know uh, but hopefully it, it will involve much more connection absolutely um Regarding changes in the polar regions that we see and that we can actually visually track over the past 20, 30, 40 years since start of expedition industry, um, I've had the luck to work on, on an icebreaker this past summer in the Arctic and the CO situation has been very, very different from the past, let's say, 10, 15 years. It was a very exceptional year in East Greenland, we had surprisingly strong ice, while in the north, towards the North Pole, we had surprisingly thin and very few ice. Um, given the cha uh, changes that are underway and um, the, the radical changes in the polar regions, what do you think? How is that going to change the perception of, of guests traveling to the areas? How is that going to impact our environment we're working? Two things come to mind immediately. One is just this, this sensibility around what affects sea ice annually and its larger cycles and what role our industry plays in affecting sea ice. You know, how icebreakers come into space and you know, reorganize sea ice. Um, also speaking from experience as well, you know, it, it, I think it's something we can become much more uh, 
take much more care and attention in how we approach that. I think that will be a feature of the future yeah. of our industry with icebreakers, no, no doubt. You know, we'll start treating it as as something that is much more finite, I think, than we tend to treat it right it's, now. And, you know, the fact that it is its own habitat, right? I think, you know, we've certainly always experienced travelers who are coming to the edges of the earth to experience them before they are quote unquote gone or quote unquote, you know, changed in such a radical way that they've lost some essential intrinsic thing. So we, we've experienced that from the beginning, I think, of, of the industry in some ways. And I'm curious to see how that continues to evolve. I think, you know, the responsibility is on the industry to show how each year with each destination we are giving more than we're taking. And I think that's very diffuse right now. It's very opaque. I'm not sure we can really say that we are doing that clearly. Um, And it's very difficult from, from company to company, ship to ship. Absolutely. Huh. Absolutely. And I feel like with sea ice especially, that's a huge question that we need to take up. I think it's a one part of the environment that's very, very poorly understood still. It's just really something, also in the industry, I really think that uh, within the industry there's very little knowledge, proper knowledge about sea ice and that needs to grow much, much more as that will become uh, a much bigger... I don't want to say playground, but um, workspace, work environment, I think. I think more ships, more new uh, new built ships are built in ice class to play around uh, stronger ice conditions. And at the same time, you see those stronger ice conditions retreating. So it's a, a very weird development that's um, countering each other. Yeah. I'm, I'm really curious to see how that develops and where it goes to. And, and will we have the discipline to show restraint? Yes, absolutely. What's your personal goals in the polar region for the next five, ten years? To stay connected to the people that are working here and uh, to continue to stay connected to the, the places as well. And, I guess for me what that means is a lot more conversations. Uh, I think I've felt in my in my personal history I've felt really protective over my experiences and wanting to share as a guide, you know, the day that we have before us. Um, but sort of in terms of the industry, it's taken me a long time to really look outward and feel as though all those other guides are my colleagues and friends, you know, and that we're here ultimately as one team to protect and showcase, bring people back safe. I, personally, I hope to stay as a honestly humble but relevant voice in the industry as we continue to grow and change and perhaps even experiencing this idea of non-growth maybe yes. even counter-growth yes. is our pathway forward um, that would be very exciting as well so I just hope to stay involved Henry <laughs> me too <laughs> hope to see you along the way yeah hope to see you along the way as well you going home tomorrow? yes yeah you plan of coming back this season? We'll see. I don't have plans currently. I've been so lucky, fortunate to have worked many consecutive seasons back to back to back in the Antarctic and Arctic prior to COVID, of course. And uh, like some of my friends and colleagues I've experienced over the last couple of years of uncertainty around our professional lives and uh, just a moment of pause and reflection that's brought me to a place where 
I want to just take a step back from field work and uh, but continue to stay involved in the industry and I'm still trying to figure out what that's going to mean what my uh, <laughs> new relationship with the polar regions is going to be uh, but uh, we'll definitely definitely be involved in one way or another and uh, I remember talking a number of years ago to uh, an expedition leader uh, Laurie Dexter who's was with Quark for a long time and uh, marine expeditions and uh, other companies and uh, he was just describing to me about his personal sacrifice of what he experienced as an expedition leader and uh, a lot of it really being this deep uh, fatigue mental, emotional, physical fatigue that he would just push aside because of the love, right, of, of doing this work and being able to have this relative autonomy in the field to go and explore and um, facilitate experiences for people. And uh, I finally feel like I might have a sensibility for what he means. And I, I kind of feel of in, in, in our job, we tend rather to put that aside because there is this fire burning inside to to make sure that the next group of guests has the same kind of experience, this once-in-a-lifetime trip, and really get involved as much as the previous one. And you rather accept your own fatigue, your own... Um, you're not caring about your own well-being, but taking care about your team more about, than about yourself and this. And I also have the feeling that COVID has changed that a lot, Had actually has actually drawn our attention to our own well-being a lot. What do you think? Well put. Yeah, I can certainly relate to that. And, uh, Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. That was it for this episode. I love hearing those stories and thoughts. Really good. Thanks, Henry, for recording this. Uh, and thank you so much for listening. Thanks for your time. Uh, if you want to send us feedback, if you have anything to add, we are at Curiously Polar on the Twitters. Um, you can find all other episodes at curiouslypolar.com or wherever you get your other podcasts. Um, if you're listening to this on YouTube, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. And you can also leave us a comment there. That uh, that that helps us, that tickles the algorithm and uh, it helps the show to get suggested to more people. So thanks for that and uh, talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs>